Sarah from Growing Up Fundy with a Y. Thank you for being a guest on Growing Up Fundy with an IE. How are you doing this evening? Thanks for having me. I'm good. 100% of the proceeds gained from this monetized episode will be donated to sciencesaves.org. Thanks for listening. So for anybody listening, the connections between us just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It is too small of a world. Um, So initially, to give them a little background, I reached out to you because I've had this podcast for uh, at this point, at the point where I reached out to you, I'd had the podcast for about a year. And I finally was setting up an Instagram account. And from my Instagram account, I was trying to tag it and yours popped up. And I was like, what is this? This is so cool. Cause like it had never popped up before. And I was like, is this a different podcast? And then I found the, you have like an episode of a podcast out. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was such an interesting coincidence. So I was like, I'm going to reach out and see if she wants to be on my podcast. And then we found out after you had already agreed to be on the podcast that your grandma was my piano teacher in Northwest Arkansas. And then we found out that we live in the same neighborhood currently, which I, they don't know where I live. So you're still safe. You're good. But like, what is, that is yeah, so it's, wild. It's pretty wild. It's That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what I thought was like the funniest part was you had already been like, yeah, I'll be on your podcast before we found out any of that stuff. So that was yeah. just nuts. Yeah, I, I had listened to your first episode because I was like, okay, I'm going to be on this podcast. Let me see, like, what it's like. And then I'm like, wait, yeah, wait. <laughs> what, how old are you? I just turned 30. Okay, I'm going to be 32. So I'm a little older than you. I was going to say, if we're the same age or, like, we have the same <laughs> birthday, I'm out of here. I'm just going to hang up. And, just kidding. I would stay on because that that's, like, kindred spirits. Well, so – I don't even know where to begin. So where did you come up with the name Growing Up Fundy? Where did that come from and like the idea for the accounts and stuff? Yeah, so it all started, I don't even know what year this was. It might have been the end of 2019 or early 2020 or something. Um, I was just like talking with my sister and, um, you know, we both left fundamentalism and everything and like we're not really religious anymore um and my brother-in-law we were talking about like the church we grew up in and just like crazy shit that happened and like I don't know old drama I don't even remember what we were talking about but my brother-in-law was like I mean he grew up in a church too but like it wasn't crazy (laughs) as crazy (laughs) so he was always just like so fascinated by listening to us talk about things he's like what what do you have open yeah um (laughs) So he was the one who came up with the idea. He was like, you should start a podcast. So at the time I was like, okay, yeah, maybe I can do that. Um, So I tried to start a podcast and it just didn't really work, but I created the Instagram account and then it just kind of grew from there. Um, But the name, actually, my friend came up with the name because I couldn't figure out what to call it. And then she came up with it. And I didn't even like think of spelling it with an IE. I just... Yeah, I didn't think about spelling it with a Y either. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, of course. Like, because when I'd been Googling, because I wanted to make sure I didn't like steal anybody's name, it didn't pop up, but I didn't think to spell it with a Y like at all. Yeah. Interesting. That's so, so then you did grow up in, within like fundamentalism. Was that from your parents? Was that from grandparents? Like, how did you get involved in fundamentalism? So yeah, it was my parents. Um, So my dad grew up religious, but so just to back up a bit, um, because in your first podcast that I listened to, um, when you mentioned the Duggars, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. with them, I was like, okay. And then that's how I knew that when you said your piano teacher taught them, I was like, oh, that's my grandmother. So yeah. Wild. Wild. My grandmother um, or my dad's family was um, very religious. um, And then he kind of... Uh, I don't know. He had, he sowed some wild oats in the (laughs) seventies. Might be too much information, but he's not going to see this. So it's fine. (laughs) Um, And then, um, my mom actually did not grow up religious at all. And she, um, wow. Found Jesus when she was in high school. 
Um, and then, so they met in Florida when they were in their twenties and then they got married. They had all of us kids in Florida. Um, so yeah, they went to like several types of churches. Um, but the one that they landed in, in Arizona was kind of in the Bob Jones camp. So interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And so at the time when you were growing up, did it seem strict to you? Did you enjoy it? Did you not really care? Like, what were your thoughts about going to church when you were a kid? I mean, it was just so normal. I never even considered a different lifestyle. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. I was, I was totally bought in. I was like the perfect little church kid. Like I, I never acted out really. I, um, I never did anything crazy in high school. Like I never had a rebellious phase or anything like that. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I was totally bought into it all. And, um, you know, I went to the Christian school um, attached to the church as well. So, like, I didn't really have any friends outside of the church. So, um, you know, I never got into any trouble or anything. And then, yeah, once I um, graduated high school, I was, like, trying to figure out where to go to college. So I ended up going to Bob Jones because I was very into music at the time. Um, so I was wanted to be a, p a piano teacher. Um, and that's where my piano teacher was. So I was like, okay, I'll just go to Bob Jones. Wow. Uh, so, so yeah, it was kind of a big um, decision looking back, but I don't know. It just seemed so normal at the time. So you were pretty devout for a long time, like far into your life. Yes. So <laughs> I didn't actually start deconstructing until my last semester in college like right before I graduated and I actually changed my major. So, um, I was a piano major for the first two years and then I kind of ha started having some wrist problems. So then I switched my major to missions. So I was planning on becoming a missionary. And like, how do you, when you're going to Bob Jones, like for people who don't know, like this is wild to me, um, uh, for people who don't know, like Bob, jo how would you describe Bob Jones for people who are unfamiliar? Well, it's loosened up a lot since I oh, graduated. Has it? So I graduated okay. in 2016. Um, and just to give some background. So just a few years before I got there, like, I want to say, well, I got there in 2012. Um, but like, I'm pretty sure even in like 2010, like women were still required to wear pantyhose. Like, yeah, I'm like, yep hats on Sundays, like extremely strict, like no pants. You couldn't even wear pants off campus when I first got there. Um, and then they just started like gradually changing the rules, like slightly, like one year it was like, okay, you're allowed to wear jeans off campus now. And then like, you're okay. You're allowed to wear jeans on campus after 5 PM. Like I'm not making this up. Like these were actual. <laughs> no, I know you're not. That's what's so <laughs> wild about it. Yeah. <laughs> incremental rules that just kept getting slightly looser um and then yeah uh it eventually the i think was the year after i graduated so i graduated in 2016 the year after that women were finally allowed to wear pants to class so wow do you I like it <laughs> yeah i was gonna say not jeans they're not complete not jeans i don't know like, what it is but <laughs> do, do you think it's because too many people were looking at him being like what's going on there? Like, what is happening with you guys over there at Bob Jones? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, a lot shifted when Steve Pettit became the president. Mm. Um, and there's been a lot of drama recently, actually. I don't know if you've heard anything about it, but no. Oh, it, like it got crazy. I don't even know all the details, but I'm um, look it up. like a couple months ago, I can't even remember what started all the drama exactly, but it was something, some guy on the board, um, he was the chairman of the board, I think. I hope I don't get this wrong. Anyway, he, um, he had something against Steve Pettit and like, he thought that Pettit was taking the, the school too liberal and too progressive and like it's not even progressive but I think I I think I remember this now I remember seeing headlines because yeah. I was thinking like Bob Jones too progressive what like women are allowed to talk out loud now like is that what's going on yeah. over there? <laughs> weird yeah so then um Steve Pettit released a letter saying if this guy doesn't resign then I'm resigning um and then I don't know the time period, but 
a little bit later than apparently the chairman of the board did resign. So I assume that Pettit's staying on, but yeah. for a minute there, it was like Pettit's leaving, like they're going back to their old ways and it's going to like die out. I'm surprised they, they took his side. I, I would, I'll be curious to find out like why that was, but um, I mean, the students love Pettit, like the, Oh, that makes sense. The when students like, are not going back to like their enrollment has already dropped so much. Like it used to be makes... a bigger school. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, fundamentalism, I think is dying. So totally, totally. <laughs> it absolutely. But the, the reason I, I just had you dive into that is because the idea of somebody deconstructing while at Bob Jones is like, that's like the eye of Sauron. That's like the center of the universe in terms of fundamentalism, like modern day yeah. fundamentalism. And so how, how did that happen? Like how did, like you would think you would just be like your most devout or something there. Why right. was it? And I, and I totally was up until it was actually like my apologetics class of all things. Interesting. That's so, so interesting. <laughs> yeah. So people as you know, I'm sure like people always make assumptions about people deconstruct for all these types of reasons. Oh, you just wanted to sin. Oh, you just were never a really a, a real Christian, you know, the, hack it. the yeah. two main ones, but I mean, everyone's deconstruction story is a little bit different, but like cool. for me, um, yeah, it was my last semester. I was getting ready to go become a missionary. Like I'd already done like a missions internship um, I was still very much bought in. And then this class, um, to their credit, they did make us watch, um, atheist and theist debates. Interesting. And like a certain amount of hours, um, which I think is really good because yeah. it was a big thing for me, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, it just, I think I'd always had questions deep down um about things and I just I would just always justify it the way that you know I was told to like basically I don't know maybe this sounds stupid but um the to me it's like at a certain point everything that they try to justify with just comes down to you need to take it by faith you know what i'm saying yes yeah 100 uh, percent. that doesn't sound stupid at all yeah so yeah it just listening to these debates i was just thinking about things that i had never really admitted to myself before or you know they'd always been in the back of my head but like i was finally like actually asking them and um then it came to the point where my professor you know, these questions, like he would address them and they would still be like totally unsatisfactory answers. Right. Like all pretty much boil down to you just need to take it by faith and God's plan right. is better than ours and all this stuff. And I'm just like, I can't, I couldn't justify it anymore. Um, but the biggest thing for me was learning about the doctrine of, oh my God, I was trying to look it up. <laughs> it's Calvinism. Um, yes. so for anyone who doesn't know, Calvinism is a whole thing, but like mainly the differentiating factor is, um, that God predestines every person to either be going to heaven or going to hell. Um, and honestly, to me, I got to the point where well, I was going to a pretty Calvinist church, um, back in Arizona at That's the time. Wild. Yeah. So they had like contemporary worship. Like I had left my fundamentalist church that I grew up in um, while I was at school, but like I was going back and forth, you know? So, um, but yeah, I felt like Calvinism did make the most sense. Like if God is in control of everything, then like he's in control of everything. You know what I mean? Like right. I could never understand the whole, he's in control of everything, but also man has free will. And like, it's just, didn't seem to drive you know what I mean so totally yeah and honestly like taking the more like conservative route to me also makes more sense too that that idea that it's like either he is in charge of everything or he isn't we can't have this he's in charge of everything and he's omnipotent and he's omniscient but also you have free will it's like one of those does not yeah. math 
yeah, it just, it didn't make sense to me anymore. And, and also like, so I felt like I was kind of a Calvinist at the time, but then I um, learned about my professor actually brought up like the doctrine of, I forget the word, but <laughs> Calvinists would probably know. Um, basically the idea that yes, like God does make billions of people to send them to hell. Um, and at that point I was just like, you actually like said that out loud. Like I can't worship a God that would do that. Like what? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> totally. Totally. Crazy to me. Um, mm -hmm. So that was like the beginning of the end, but like, I wasn't ready to like become an atheist or anything. Totally. At the time. So I went on, I graduated. Um, when I got home, I joined a small group of um, some ladies in the church. They were like all married and everything. And um, I brought up some of my questions and concerns and like, it just seemed to confirm to me that like there were no answers, like right. no way to justify this in my mind. Like I just can't, uh, there's no answer. So um, at that point, yeah, I started going to church less and then I moved out of my parents' house in with my sister. And that's when I was finally like, okay, I'm going to just stop going to church for a while. See if I get struck by lightning or like if I really become miserable, because I mean, that was a big thing. I don't know if you felt the same way, like heard the same things, but would, you know, it was very drilled into me that like, if you leave the faith, if you stray, you're going to be miserable. Your life yes. is going to become a failure. Yeah. Like, all of the bad things. Right. Or if you enjoy it, it's because the bad people got you. So like you yeah. may leave and you may have a lot of fun, but just know that within that fun is like sin and hatred for God and, and you're you never going to feel joy and like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, um, so honestly, when I stopped going, it was kind of an experiment. I was like, let's just see how I feel, you know, like, is it really gonna, am I really going to be miserable? And it was like the most freeing thing ever. <laughs> so that's and so you've kind of never looked back since then I mean I yeah well I did have a friend from college who came out and did a like certification program and so like I think it was that summer or maybe it was the summer after but um I didn't know how to like tell her that I wasn't religious anymore like I still considered myself a Christian um, for a while after I stopped going to church, but mm -hmm. I wasn't like actively deconstructing. It was just kind of like, I want to just live my life for a while and like not think about it as much as possible. But yeah, when my college friend had come out, like I just went to church with her, like just out of obligation. I didn't know right. how to talk about things, you know, it right. took me years before I could like articulate what I was feeling or what I believe or anything like yeah it's a yeah process. yeah and did you go through I feel like I went through this and I've heard people say they went through this um where when you start to recognize like I think I'm deconstructing you actually hang on a little bit tighter for like a couple more years or like maybe one more year because you're like no 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 I can't fail at this I can't be the one who like fails at being a Christian like no this isn't happening this is what they always warned me about like the devil coming to get me did you have any of that or was it pretty steady I don't think I've really felt that. Um, That's good. That's but I good. also, I didn't even know the word deconstructing until right. like I started that account, which was like a few years after I stopped going to church, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. I didn't know that word until <laughs> lockdown, I think <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Um, so does your family know, are they upset about it? Like, did you feel like you had to kind of come out as like <laughs> no longer Christian? So, um, it's been a process there too. So like, like I said, when I first stopped going to church, I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know how to articulate what I was going through, what I was feeling. And so, yeah, my parents did confront me, um, several times. Um, especially my mom. <laughs> I love my parents. I still, I have a good, a pretty good relationship with them. Um, but 
Yeah, there were some bumps in the road for sure um, because I was like the one kid that had gone to Bible college. Like right. <laughs> none of my siblings were. Right. Well, both of my sisters had stopped going to church even before me. Um, my brother is still a Christian now, um, but he's like the only one that's still religious. And um, so, yeah, I like, I was pretty close with my mom, especially in college. And we would talk about our walks with God and everything. And so I think it was hard to like lose that part of our relationship. And it was really hard for her because as you know, like my parents, literally think I'm going to go to hell. So like, right. yeah, obviously right. that's very hard on them. Totally. <laughs> and, and I yeah. get it. But um, yeah. <clears throat> so at a certain point, I think it was in 2020, actually, we were on a family vacation and my mom um, like kind of cornered me one night after like everyone else had gone to bed and she was Basically, she told me, and this is going to sound terrible, <laughs> but she kind of told me that I was not going to find a husband until I get right with the Lord. Um, oh, God, no, no, please <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> and, like, I was dating someone at the time, and, like, I was very happy, and, yeah. you know, it was, I just had to, like, and she also came out and like told me that she had assumed that I had left because like I got turned off by people in the church or something like I was hurt by someone. Um, so I basically had to tell her, no, like that actually wasn't the reason. Like I know all of the reasons why I should have stayed and everything. It's not like about the people and whatever. Yeah. It wasn't about people for me. You know, it was about like, things that didn't make sense anymore and like why would god create such a system that like people can't even understand you know what i mean like right right <laughs> and it's this idea where it's like even if god was real if he's the kind of person who will create human beings for the sole purpose of sending them to burn for eternity in hell that's not who i want to follow yeah that's not somebody who deserves my worship and my prayer right yeah. Yeah, that's it. So, also the idea that like going to hell is the first threat and then not finding a man is the second threat is kind of hilarious to me. It's like, oh, yeah, well, if the fear of burning forever doesn't scare you, this will. <laughs> yeah. Lie alone. So I I had a talk with her like the next day we continued our conversation and I kind of just told her like, you know, the more that you bring this up, the more it drives a wedge between us. So, like, if you want a good relationship with your kids, like, you need to stop confronting us about this. Because it wasn't just me. Like, she yeah. would also yeah. had confronted my sisters many times, too. And, yeah, you know, I want a close relationship with my parents. And I yeah. think they want close relationships with their kids, too. But, you know, that I don't think she understood that that was driving a wedge between us and right. I, she also apologized for like some of the analogies oh, that, cool. she, <laughs> that she used um because i i'll just tell you because she's not going to see this um one of them was when i well, when i first left the church she said i was in a ditch <laughs> wow i don't even really understand what that means but um like it's a little offensive right <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm not in a ditch. I'm in a great place in my life. Like, I'm so happy. Like, <laughs> You're like, if this is a ditch, then I love it here. Then this is great. This is a wonderful ditch. Yeah. I think um, I, I've always thought, uh, I, I feel like it's a lot easier to look back on stuff like that once you're out of it and to kind of look at it with like a, a more sympathetic lens than when you're in the middle of it. Once you're on the other side, it's easier to kind of turn around and analyze it. And I've always thought that when – religious parents do that when they you know wig out when they confront you when they like make threats when they use analogies like that i honestly truly don't believe that it comes from a place of trying to attack you or hurt your feelings i think they are one they feel like they failed 
they feel like they were they failed as parents within the church they failed as parents before god and they're like wigging out they don't know what they did wrong quote unquote yeah. to make their kids turn from god and i think uh, the other thing is they are genuinely so scared that you are going to burn in hell for eternity that they like they cannot fathom how else to get the point across to you yeah. than to say like jarring things like that because in their mind you are literally going to burn forever like how can yeah. you be so chill about it do you not understand the seriousness of the situation yeah it's it's honestly really sad and i still you know part of me still feels bad um, yeah about it i just wanted to pull up a song okay there's a song that's really it's about this exact topic. The name of the song I was referencing is Sorry by James and the Shame. It's basically written from the point of view of like us, like apologizing to our parents for like disappointing you. And like, yeah, it's it's really sad that they think that I'm going to burn forever, but I just yeah. don't believe it anymore. So like- Right, <laughs> right. And it's like, what is worse? lying in the face of everyone you care about because that's a sin or yeah. not believing because you truly haven't seen what you need to see to believe either you're lying and you're not believing and you're faking it and you're faking out everybody in your life and you're faking out god right or you are honest and at least that's not a sin right like just right. being honest um that's so interesting and so did your siblings kind of beat you to the punch in that regard or did you start that conversation first and you found out they were less religious um so I'm the youngest of four so my older sister was the first one who stopped going to church and then it's my brother who's still um, a Christian and then my other sister who's right above me um she stopped going to church before I did as well so and like they had both stopped going to church when I was um like at Bob Jones, I was still very religious and like, we weren't as close because of that, because I was pretty judgmental, right? Like I was yeah. so bought in that I was very, like, it was not cool to be yeah. around. Like, yeah. In yeah. That way. <laughs> Been there. Yep. So, um, but yeah, I think they had never really figured out how to navigate it with my parents. Exactly. Like I had, I think I had actively deconstructed more than um, both my sisters. Just, I think mostly because of the account that I started. And then I just started like learning more about it. And I was like, oh, interesting. And then I started listening to um, the Recovering from Religion podcast. Yeah. I, I don't really listen to it anymore, but like I listened to like the first the the hosts that were like the two old guys they were great um i remember in 2020 like i would just put that on and like go for a walk in my neighborhood every day and yep it helped me work through a lot of shit and they were very like they just seemed like nice guys you know and yeah they, like, totally they had i think one or both of them had been pastors and so just hearing somebody say like it's okay to be where you're at and like to be thinking the thoughts that you're having and like <laughs> it's totally like normal and like you're not a terrible person for yeah going to church anymore and not absolutely anymore. <laughs> yeah and I think that's also a super interesting experience um I know that there's always outliers in every group but ever since being exposed to like atheist media, atheist YouTube, atheist TikTok, atheist podcast, it's all a bunch of really nice people. Like, mm -hmm. they're funny, and some of them can be kind of crass, you know, and use whatever language they want. But, like, it's it's interesting. It's almost like the familial bond that I was supposed to always form in church, but for whatever reason just could never fit in in that way. And now I feel like I have that bond and that friendship with so many people who identify as, like, secular or agnostic or atheist. Um, and that always just struck me as so interesting because I think you're supposed to believe that atheist people are lost and they're hurting and they're miserable and they're angry. And of course, the first couple of debate videos you see, they might come across that way. There's, you know, there's always those, those, um, like far end of the spectrum for yeah. both groups, yeah. but, um, it's actually a lot of like fulfilled, happy, stress-free, 
no longer self-harming, you know, no longer yeah. worried about the rapture people that are like very pleasant to be around. And yeah. I also think there's something about being friends with a person who's very kind, who you know doesn't believe that they're going to get heaven points at the end for being kind to you because they don't believe in heaven. To me, that almost seems like a more genuinely kind person. Yeah. They're just kind because they want to be kind. Yeah. There's no points in the end. Um, so when you were like a little kid, did you think that like being a missionary was kind of like the end all be all? Was that like the hero in your mind of somebody who was like the ultimate Christian or like what in your mind was the goal as a kid? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I wasn't really the, that into missions until college I would say I mean it was kind of a hard decision when I like started having risk problems I was like I don't know what I'm gonna do but I'd like need to graduate yeah, yeah. so <laughs> and, kind of... and you get to go all over the world so that's cool <laughs> yeah um I guess I had I had always wanted to be like a pastor's wife or something um interesting yeah or like a missionary's wife well like a missionary's a pastor normally so um yeah, I really thought I was going to, like, meet someone and get married um, at school, which I'm very glad did not happen. <laughs> that was one of my questions. I was like, how did you make it out of Bob Jones without getting married? That's impressive. Um, um, because I'm, like, very reserved and I have resting bitch face. And um, people thought I was snobby. I, like, I'm just a quiet person. And so, like, the, the combination of resting bitch face and being quiet is, like, not – great for like meeting men so <laughs> I that's, don't personal, so. <laughs> that's really funny that's and it's interesting because your instagram account is so funny like the some of like the memes i was looking at and like the post the past posts like the the commentary is like it's witty but it's sharp and it's on point and like a lot of it is like oof like real um and so it's funny that you're saying like you're a reserved person because when I was looking at that account, I pictured somebody like boisterous and like animated yeah. and kind of like in your face a little bit. And you're like, no, I don't like to meet people very much. I mean, I feel like I can be more like that because I don't yeah. really put my face out there. Like right. I'm, I'm okay with it now. But like when I first started it, I was like so paranoid. Like, well, my parents actually left Arizona. So they moved out here actually. Um, uh, but at the time, you know, they were still there. They were still going to church with all these people. I didn't want to like, I didn't want it to get back to them that I was like, right. running some account, like about growing up in church. And so, um, yeah, like immediately when I made it, I like blocked a bunch of people that I like from that church just to like make sure, but now I'm kind of just like, fuck it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, and so how has your life changed positively negatively general since you've like admitted to yourself i am not a religious person do you do you consider yourself atheist or agnostic or i would say agnostic yes i don't fucking know what's out there you know yeah. like i my life has changed a lot i've gone through a lot of um growth it's been quite a journey i mean my 20s were like a really wild ride. I mean, I graduated sure. at 23. I moved back to Arizona and then um, for a few years. And then I moved to California for three years on my own. Like, wow. Barely knew anyone. Um, and so that was like a huge growing point for me because I like, I kind of did it as a test. I wasn't like planning on putting down roots in California. I just kind of just was like, let's see if I can make it on my own, like for real. Because, yeah. In Arizona, I had been living with my sister and like paying like no rent. So that's nice. That's nice. <laughs> Having to like figure out, find a place to live, move all my shit. Like, yeah, it was it was intense. But um, it's nice now where I'm at, like being closer to family and everything. But um, yeah, I feel like I'm a completely different person than I was at even 23. So. Totally. And I loved what you said about how like back when you were your most like devout, you were kind of like insufferable a little bit to be around because I feel like we we were all there at some point. I feel like 
around the age of 12, I feel like we all get super fundy where we're like, everything I'm going to ever talk about is God. I'm going to take my Bible to school and stuff. Um, but also, yeah, I, I think like when I was in college and I was still super religious, like, oh, like, oh, like current me would have hated, hated college me. I could have had so much yeah. more fun in college. I had a great time in college, but like, I just know that I was that religious girl in everyone's life where they were like, hide the bottles like Sydney's coming over you know like put out the bud like Sydney's gonna be nearby like we don't want her getting all you know uppity about it yes. um and it's like funny but also like because we know what that kind of person's like from the outside now yeah and um shit what was I gonna say oh my god wait god damn it was it about being closer to family or um no being the oh i was just gonna mention like i was just talking with my coworker the other day because i have a atheist coworker who sits like right next to me at work so it's like fun because he grew up religious too so um but we were talking the other day and like he still looks at his facebook memories but like i was telling him like i literally can't do it like i just used to post like bible verses and i do it just to delete it i have time hop just to delete all that stuff Oh, that's a good idea. It picks it up and I'm like, done, delete, delete. I know like you can't delete everything permanently off the internet, but at least I don't have to see it. Like at least I don't. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah I haven't looked at my Facebook memories in so long because it's just, it's too cringe. Uh, do you ever remember something that you used to believe or you used to like encourage and just think like, girl, like what? Um, there was, I mean, I used to be very against gay marriage, obviously. Wow. Um, so yeah, there was a friend that I had, um, right after I graduated college actually. And he was a really close friend at the time. Um, and then he, I don't, I guess he came out to me and I was probably just very judgmental about it. I don't know. It was a lot of weird shit going on. Um, but yeah, I thought I was being kind, but I basically told him he need, should go talk to like a pastor or something. Yeah. So um, anyway, our friendship ended and actually that was like a really big turning point in my life uh, because up until that point, I like literally didn't even know who I was. Um, yeah. I, had no concept of like taking care of myself. I still remember like my friend, my friend that came up with the name for my uh, page, actually. Um, we, were, I mean, she, we were high school friends. So she was the one who told me after that whole friend breakup thing. Um, she was like, how are you taking care of yourself? Like, what are you doing to take care of yourself? And it was like such a foreign concept. Like I didn't even know what she was talking about. I'm like, take care of myself like I'm irrelevant you know like yeah it was so disassociated from my own body like yeah it was it was bad um I was very codependent with that friend and I completely understand why it we parted ways now looking back because I was fucking crazy <laughs> like yeah. Because I was a fucking lunatic. Yeah. And also I think the like servitude idea that a lot of organized religions have very much confuse people and when it does come to taking care of themselves that's like such a foreign idea to them because everything is about serve serve god serve your family serve your father serve those who are in need serve those in your you know your vicinity and so the idea of like serving yourself is like that seems like a sin <laughs> like taking care of myself yeah. seems like it should be illegal yeah and like loving yourself too mm -hmm. i mean I remember my pastor growing up, like, would literally do sermons about, like, he would literally say, like, you shouldn't love yourself. Like, everyone loves their, themselves enough. Like, yeah, that's vanity if you love yourself too much. Yeah. Um, and, like, I took that shit so seriously. Like, I internalized all of it, like, so much. It was, it was a really big shift for me to realize, like, yeah, I should actually take care of myself. Like, how do I even do that? You know? Yeah. The kudos to your friend, though, for asking the right questions. Because sometimes that's all it takes is somebody asking the right question and we don't have the answer to it. And then we suddenly turn a page or we spiral or we have to figure out what that answer is. Yeah. And then, I mean, she grew up um, religious, too. And she's still a Christian now. But she's like, 
a very healthy Christian. Like she, she does know how to take care of herself and, you know, it's, it's yeah. great. I'm, I'm very happy for, you know, I, a lot of atheists I think are trying to convince people to leave religion and that's never really been my thing. I'm just kind right. of like, you know, if you're happy in that, like, good for you. You know, I'm yeah. not trying to convince anyone of anything. <laughs> yeah. To me, it's like, as long as it's not harmful to you or anybody around you, then by all means. Yeah. It's just rare that you run into a situation where it's not harmful for that person. You know, like, can they honestly say that it's not? Some people can. Some people can literally be like, I'm, I love this. It gives me a family. It gives me a purpose. It gives me a place to go. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fantastic. I have seen some of the best people I know in my life are devout Christians because they're doing it the right way, quote unquote, you know, they're doing it the kind way. But at the same time, is that the biblical way? I don't think so. You know what I mean? Like, and so yeah. I've always wondered if there's going to be, especially with like millennials and Gen Z, if there's going to be a branch of, they might call themselves Christians for a while, but maybe not even Christians anymore that want to follow the teachings of Jesus, but they don't want to follow the rules of the Bible. They want to be kind and they want to be gracious and they want to, you know, lead people to the Lord. But in order to follow the rules of the Bible, you got to do some heinous shit and you got to have some pretty heinous ideas and beliefs. And so I, I've always wondered why some people still call themselves Christians when, in my opinion, they are actually better than what the rules of being a Christian are, you know, like we have, we have an idea of what a Christian means, but I feel like that's a very modernized, Americanized version of Christianity. If you actually read the Bible, a lot of it does not apply to what we now know as like the modern Christian. They're kind of sweeping a lot of the stuff under the rug that's a little bit nasty or a little bit ugly or a little bit inconvenient, mm -hmm. um, which I'm glad. Don't get me wrong. Like I would, I love LGBT affirming churches. I love to see women as pastors. I love to see all that, but that's not biblical. Yeah you know? Yeah. But I mean, the Bible is so many things. In it's one. a lot of things, you know, like I, I think of Jesus, this may sound weird, but I think of Jesus as like an old friend, you yeah, know? And totally. like, he seemed like a cool guy, you know, yeah. like, he seemed like, yeah, a, kind of a hippie. I don't know. Like I'm kind of a hippie. So like, yeah, I feel like we would have gone <laughs> along with Jesus, honestly. Yeah. He, he was about like, bucking the system which i'm about that too you know like but it's just the way that the church has like hijacked his message and right come combined with like all the other crazy shit in the bible yeah. it's just yeah. like not for me <laughs> yeah i don't think jesus is bad and i don't think belief in god is bad um i think it's organized religion that hurts a lot of people because yeah. a lot of the rules that churches have especially like Baptist churches and fundamentalists and evangelical are kind of made up by the people who run them. Yes. You know, like a lot of the ideas are just what we know to do and the rules we know to follow. Um, but I, I think there's like, I think there's a happy medium. And I think a lot of the people that we know that are excellent people and they're awesome people um, and they still identify as Christians, I think they're that happy medium. And I'm almost like, why don't you come up with a new title for yourself? Because I don't think you fit the title of Christian. I think you fit something better almost. Um, I mean, progressive Christian is a term yeah. that's used. And like, yeah, that's like the best I can come up with is like progressive yeah. Christian. Yeah. I mean, I think Unitarian churches. Yeah. Like there's that. one like right over here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Without going into any further detail, <laughs> I realize. <laughs> yeah, I've driven past it. Um, I almost like want to visit just to see what it'd be like. I mean, me just, too. Like, we should. Yeah. Go we should. Yeah, let's do it. We should put go. a church together. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I I think there's a lot to be um hopeful for in terms of like these new wave christians like my best friend devout christian it sounds like your friend is a christian as well and like they're really good people and they do great things and they do it because they want to not because of the heaven points at the end you yeah. know they're legitimately they're good people like, truly good people yeah yeah and i think that like that gives me hope because i think you're right when like evangelicalism and like fundamentalism is dying and i think you know calvinism and things like that are are 
going out. Um, but it is interesting to kind of think about where will they be? Where will these people be in the next 30 years? Will they be the same? Will they be more devout? Will they, cause you know, I, I think people talk about how you get more conservative as you get older. Um, I don't know that that's going to be true with millennials and Gen Z, but I'll be interested to see. Yeah. It's definitely the case for my parents, but <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's an interesting thing to think about because yeah, so many millennials have left the church. I don't, and especially Gen Z too. Like, I don't know how they're going to survive, especially really strict churches like the ones that we grew up in. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Are there any parts of religion or Christianity that you keep with you that you're like, I actually kind of enjoyed this piece of advice or verse or something? Um, I was just thinking about this recently, actually. It's kind of going back to what we talked about earlier, you know, I'm sure you've heard the acronym joy, Jesus, others, you. No. Oh, I was like, I heard that. <laughs> brainwashing 101 for me. <laughs> <laughs> like, for that so many that. times. Um, yeah, you put Jesus first, others second, and then yourself last. That literally goes right back to what we were talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, I don't fully live like that anymore. Uh, Jesus isn't on, like, my radar. Um, but I think growing up with that awareness, um, it still stick with, sticks with me now, like being considerate of others. Yeah. Um, and that's something that like me and my um, family, you know, that was like really drilled into us. And I appreciate that a lot because there are a lot of really inconsiderate people in the world. And it kind of pisses me off when people just don't have like common decency anymore, right. you know, like, yeah, you have no concept of how your actions could even affect me. Like I'm just maybe like, I'm probably still too aware of it, of others needs. And like, I can still feel bad about things that like, I don't need to feel bad about <laughs> like, like small things. I'm like, Oh, I should have like done this to like make their life easier. But yeah at the end of the day, like I am getting better about like, no, like you don't, other people's emotions are not my problem necessarily. That was a really big thing I had to learn because that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like my, my mom, um, I'm not trying to bad mouth her, but no. she, you know, she would try to project sometimes in, in terms of like, making it I don't know how do I explain this like my actions why can't I explain this is it like your actions are a reflection on her as a person kind of um or just like her emotional wellness is like my responsibility yes yeah, yeah. I don't know why that was so hard to say <laughs> yeah like that was a really big thing I had to work through. And I, I remember another friend telling me like that. Yeah. That's not like her emotional well being is not your responsibility. And that doesn't mean we should just like be, you know, really mean to people obviously, yeah. but it's like, yeah, I ha I'm responsible for myself and I'm going to be considerate of others. But like at the end of the day, I have to, look out for me and I can't be responsible for everyone else's right spirit, so yeah and like and then you're always going to run into those people where no matter how much you bend over backwards to make things more convenient for them there it's not going to be good enough yeah. and so you're either going to continue to give 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 and not get anything in return or you can be like mm, that's my boundary like I did what I could I made an attempt you know I apologized or whatever and if that's not acceptable then I guess we just disagree on that mm -hmm. yeah yeah interesting and that's a point I didn't think about is how much like that I feel like is is an experience that people have the whole like balancing other people's emotional well-being it's like not only do you have to take literal care of them but then you also have to make sure that you are not negatively impacting their emotional well-being even though that shouldn't be a role of yours at all like that shouldn't be something like you said it's one thing to be considerate of it it's another thing to be responsible for it especially yeah. as a kid yeah and I I had walked around my whole life feeling like everyone else's emotions were like my responsibility and 
you know, especially the people closest to me, um, you know, realizing that wasn't my responsibility was like a huge weight off my shoulders. So, yeah, absolutely. And what do you see for like your future? Where do you see yourself going from here? It's a great question. I just, I mean, I bought this townhome. So like, I feel like I'm putting down roots in Tennessee. So I live in Tennessee. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, people. God, no. no. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm at a like weird spot in my life at the moment. Um, like I, I'm single again. So here we are. I don't know what I'm doing, but do any of us though do any of us i accidentally shaved my head like two months ago luckily it's grown out a lot uh in that amount of time but um none of us know what we're doing is what i'm trying to yeah. say i'm just like focused on my own healing you know I've, i'm trying to heal my trauma so that you know if and when i have kids i'm not gonna just be passing along yeah the shit to them so yeah absolutely and i feel like the 30s are the best time I've only been in it for two years and it's been like the best time of my life. Like I did not know you could have this much fun just like being alive and existing because like your brain is finally where it's supposed to be. Like all the chemicals are where they're supposed to be, you know. Um, so I hope that's what the next couple of years are like for you. Um, yeah, I'm excited for my 30s. I think it'll be fun. I mean, everyone says your 30s are really fun. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to bring negative energy into yeah did you just turn 30 yeah like a month ago nice yeah I'm vibing like it's the greatest time of my life because all of my 30s friends I used to live in Chicago they were all like oh it's the greatest you're gonna have a blast yada yada and I was doing that whole I'm never gonna change from who I am right now this is the perfect version and then here you are like a, a like, different human being you know in yeah. your 30s but Completely. yeah I don't know I, I hope you enjoy it because so far it's been a blast um but I also got my ADHD medicated as well in my 30s. So maybe that's more of what it is. Maybe it's that. I don't know. I should figure that out. Uh, I should go without Adderall and see if I'm still 30 flirty and thriving. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe I'm just a little confused. But um, if you had like a message for anybody who's going through something similar to you, maybe they grew up fundamentalist and left. Maybe they're not quite out yet, but they're feeling that way they somehow see themselves in you. What would you say to them? What message would you give them? Um, I would say just what I w should have heard back then. Like if somebody could have told me, like I would tell myself, um, just listen to your intuition and get in touch with your body, like learn your body, learn how to read what your body is trying to tell you um and listen to your gut you know yeah because like I was walking around you know there was always this internal monologue that I had but it was like I thought it was the Holy Spirit but it was just like my completely overactive conscience that was like guilty over every little thing um and like that internal monologue was like so damaging yeah I now it's like I still have you know an internal monologue but it's like I'm trying to really get in touch with like my in intuition and you know it's made a really big difference for me like yeah that internal monologue has to be kinder to you yes because like if you're not even going to be nice to you why should anybody else you know yeah. yeah totally yeah and it's like you treat people how to treat you you teach people how to treat you and it's like if you don't even treat yourself nice there's no way anybody else is going to, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, Sarah, this has been wonderful. Yeah. I will link your Instagram below in the comments. Thank you for sharing your story. I'm still just blown away by the multi-level <laughs> connections that we have. And it never would have even crossed my path if you hadn't had your Instagram. And I'm so glad you do that. Um, but uh, anybody listening, I'll link the Instagram below. I'm also going to link a couple things that you talked about, like the song that you mentioned. And um, there was something else. Oh, I was going to link like, some articles about like Bob Jones and Steve Pettit and okay. stuff just so people can fill in. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time and thank you for your evening. I really yeah, appreciate having you on. It was really fun. Thank you for having me.